Hello there. So now that we've thoroughly discussed how we define systems and how we determine if momentum of that system is conserved, I want to talk a little bit about elastic and inelastic collisions. So let's go ahead and start with a little example for some of the, like, the motivation of what this topic is. So let's go ahead and say that we have two, uh, let's say, billiard balls, all right? These are just billiard balls on a pool table. Uh, and they both have some little mass m. Remember that uh, everything in blue, those are the particles of my system. So in this case, it would be accurate for me to say that my system is defined by the particles in these two balls. So the left billiard ball has an initial velocity vi, and we know that after some change in time, these two balls are going to collide together. This is the step right before the collision. After a very fast change in time, somehow the velocities between the two balls are going to redistribute, right? We're not exactly sure how that interaction is going to play out. With what we've discussed so far, we know that there's no net external forces on our system of particles. And therefore, the initial momentum of my system is equal to the final momentum of my system, right? Momentum is conserved. So because of that, so this on the left side, that would be my initial momentum. The mass of this ball times its initial velocity, vi1. And my final momentum would be the mass of ball 2 times its final velocity, v final 2. And the mass of ball 1 times its final velocity, v final 1. Right? And we're just using the definitions of momentum to come up with those terms. All right, so of course our m's would cancel out and we'd be able to deduce that uh, at the end of our collision, the sum of v1 final and v2 final must equal uh, v1 initial. That's all we're able to conclude using the conservation of momentum. And so I wanna consider a possibility, right? Because at the end of the day, we still don't know exactly what v1 final and v2 final are. So let's consider this possibility that v1 initial, right, just the velocity of this ball up here was 5 meters per second. It was just moving 5 meters per second to the right. Does it seem reasonable that v2 final would be a thousand meters per second and v1 final would be negative 995 meters per second right this satisfies the conservation of momentum 5 equals a thousand minus 995 but i don't think we've ever seen something like this occur in nature right if i uh you know shoot one pool ball at another pool ball you know, I'm not going to see one bounce off with an insane speed one way and the other one ricochet with an extreme speed the other way. So conservation of momentum is not enough to analyze this situation. Right. And so we can see that these velocities don't seem reasonable, even though our momentum is conserved. So I'm going to propose a new way to kind of analyze this situation. Suppose that instead of two balls, we just have two blocks. And again, our block on the left is going to have an initial speed V1i. Let's go ahead and start by asking what the kinetic energy of my system would be. Well, this is very easy. This would just be one half times the mass of my block times v1 initial squared. Now, suppose when these blocks get in close contact with each other, we're going to model the uh, electrostatic interaction between these two blocks through use of an imaginary spring 
and this imaginary spring is only going to appear for an instant, right? It's just going to be compressed when the two collide together, and then once they bounce off, the spring is going to disappear. Now, the exact details of how much the spring compresses, this isn't important. But after this interaction, the spring kind of just disappears. There's no more interaction between the two blocks, and they separate their separate ways. The key here is that springs and the electrostatic interactions between the two blocks, you know, if we were talking about electrostatic interactions instead of springs, these are producing conservative forces, right? So whatever the change in the potential energy of that spring is, is going to result in the negative change of kinetic energy of my system. Or in other words, whatever potential energy is stored in the spring must have come from the kinetic energy of my system. Of course, the springs are going to fully push our blocks out, and so the potential energy of my spring before the interaction, right, this was zero. There was no interaction at all between the two blocks. And at the end of the interaction, there's also zero interaction between the two blocks. The potential energy is really zero in this imaginary spring at both times. So the change in my spring's potential energy throughout this interaction is just zero. So the change in kinetic energy of my system would also be zero. So what's my final kinetic energy then? Again, it would still just be 1 half m times vi1 squared, exactly what it was before any interaction whatsoever. When the kinetic energy of my system throughout the collision is conserved, this is called an elastic collision. So let's go ahead and summarize what an elastic collision does. Of course, the momentum of my system would be conserved. This is just simply because of the conservation of linear momentum. But then also, the kinetic energy of my system would be conserved. In the real world, though, heat and sound are produced when collisions happen, right? So that implies that energy must be uh, in other forms other than just that direct uh, motion energy of the two blocks, right? We have these, we have some energy being stored in the vibrations of molecules and in sound waves. So, in the real world, really, inelastic collisions happen. The momentum of my system is still conserved, and the total energy involved is also conserved. However, because energy is spread out in different forms, like uh, in heat and sound, the final kinetic energy of my system is actually going to be less than my initial kinetic energy. In other words, there's a negative change in the kinetic energy of my system. One specific type of inelastic collision, called a perfectly inelastic collision, maximizes this kinetic energy loss. So you might immediately assume, wouldn't your final kinetic energy just always be zero. You know, if my block system started out with 12 joules, couldn't I max out the kinetic energy loss if the final kinetic energy just went to zero? Well, remember that this is incorrect because at the end of the day, momentum also has to be conserved. So we have really two equations that we have to look at. So remember, our conservation of linear momentum brought us this equation for our uh, balls. 
which led to the conclusion that V1 final plus V2 final equals V1 initial. So if these here, those are my uh, final velocities, we can create a kinetic energy term for each of them, right? 1 half m times v1 final squared plus 1 half m times v2 final squared. And this would be the final kinetic energy of my two balls. I went ahead and noted that this kinetic energy is a function of v1 final and v2 final because we don't know what v1 final and v2 final have to be in order to minimize my kinetic energy. So let's go ahead and see kind of the shape of what the, uh, this graph would look like, right? So this blue here would be this kinetic energy function uh, with the inputs v1 final and v2 final into it, right? And its absolute minimum, right, that would be zero, right, at this point down here. However, this top equation really acts as a constraint, right? Because linear momentum has to be conserved, the kinetic energy at the end of the day can't reach this absolute minimum down here. We're really trying to find this point here, right? The constrained minimum. You could probably guess, or you could probably figure out uh, what this minimum point would be with a little bit of uh, critical thinking. However, we'll go ahead and use a mathematics technique with some Lagrangians in order to figure this out. The details of this minimization process are not very important, so you can feel free to skip to the end of the conclusion. Um, so we go ahead and we define a Lagrangian with our kinetic energy function, this is just our kinetic energy function, minus some variable lambda times v1 final plus v2 final, and then we subtract our constant. I'm not going to go into too much detail on why this mathematics uh, technique works. All right. From here, if we want to find our extrema, we set the divergence of my, or to find my extrema, we set the uh, gradient of my Lagrangian to zero. This is going to produce the following equations. If I take the partial derivative of my Lagrangian with respect to V1 final, set that equal to zero, that's going to produce m times v1 final minus lambda. Repeat this for, uh, with respect to v2 final. That's going to produce m times v2 final minus lambda. And finally, uh, take my partial derivative with respect to lambda, and I get v1i minus v1 final minus v2 final. Let's go ahead and group our system of equations and see what conclusions that we come up with. The bottom equation is pretty obvious. We had already discovered this from conservation of momentum. These two equations though, we can see that if both of these guys, right, we could just move lambda to the other side. And then we'd see that m1 times v1 final equals m times v2 final. But we would see our m's would cancel out with each other and we'd get a conclusion like this, that v1 final equals v2 final. So let's go ahead and summarize what we just did. We just proved the condition for an inelastic collision, right? To, mi to minimize our kinetic energy, the blocks have to move together with the same velocity. Or in other words, the blocks stick together, right? This is the main conclusion that you want to get to. The blocks have to stick together in order to achieve the lowest possible kinetic energy. All right, so I hope this video shows 
that to fully analyze lots of situations, just the conservation of linear momentum is not enough. You need to consider the energy in the system. There are also collisions called superelastic collisions, uh, in which the final kinetic energy of your system is larger than your initial kinetic energy of the system. Uh, but those are more exceptional situations, and I don't think that I need to go into too much detail for them. All right, with that, thank you so, so much for watching.